All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the League Express podcast. My name's Jake Kinnan, and joining me as always is the editor of League Express, Martin Sadler. Martin, how was your weekend? Oh, it was pretty good. Um, it was pretty good, Jake. I actually went to St. Helens on Saturday night for their uh, celebrations of their 150th anniversary. Hmm. Um, the club was actually founded on November the 19th, 1873 in a, in a pub in St. Helens and you can see what it's become in the 150 years since then. It was a, a great event, an absolutely wonderful event organised by the St. Helens Club and all credit to them, to their chairman Eamon McManus and to all the people at St. Helens who played a part in putting on a great show. It was an invitation only black tie event and um, obviously several current players and former players were brought up onto the stage to talk about their memories of um, of, of rugby league over the you know period of its history. And there's a very good talk given by the St. Helens Club Ambassador, a guy called Charles Nevin, who's quite a well-known um, uh, journalist and, and, and writer, author. Uh, and he gave a very pleasant, amusing um, account of, of the club's history, going right back to the early days, right, right to the present. Um, and, of course, there were... Um, some some very significant um, times during that history. For example, when the club moved when the club moved to um, its current home from Nosley Road back in 2012. You know that was a a massive step, a massive change for the club, and so much so much is owed to um, its chairman and owner and main owner Eamon McManus. That uh, I think Eamon certainly deserves a medal of some sort or some sort of recognition for what he's done for that club. I think it's been amazing. Mm. I read your column and you spoke very highly about the event, and it must have left uh, yes. a pretty good impression on you. Oh yeah, I mean there was some. You know, it it, it was very well. Uh, MC'd by Tanya Arnold, the BBC um, presenter for Rugby League, and uh, you know she had some very amusing interviews actually with a, a lot of the players and former players, and uh, Paul Lachlan in particular. Um, I don't know if you'll remember, you might not remember him. He, he played probably about twenty twenty five years ago, and uh, Paul was very amusing. I've got to say, you know, as I think I said in the in the paper, probably missed his vocation as a stand up comedian. <laughs> Um, and 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 it, it it wasn't just the guys, of course, because this year the um, um, St Helens women won the Challenge Cup at Wembley, and uh, they had on stage two of the players from that team, Emily, Emily Rudge and, and Tara Jones, who both spoke extremely well about what it's like to play for St Helens as a woman. And uh, you know, it was it was great, a, a good night had by all, and um, a really you know pleasant evening and as i think i said in the column if there were 11 more clubs like st Helens in super league then the competition would be an awful lot stronger no it says a lot about the club that's for sure it and we does. also uh, had the announcement that james roby is going to be inducted or has been inducted into, into the, the hall of fame absolutely quite yeah you know m most most club hall, hall hall of fame um inductions can only take place after five a player's been retired for five years but in the case of James Roby, it's obviously very obvious that he will be uh, in the Hall of Fame eventually. So I think the feeling was, if that's inevitable, let's do it now instead of waiting. Mm. Um, and and that was, you know, I think everybody, everybody in the room certainly approved of that decision. Mm. And, and the funny thing was, James actually came onto the stage on crutches because he's had a hip operation since retiring. And uh, uh -huh. it sort of made a comment that he's... Um, you know, just taking steps to repair his body yeah. after a long career in rugby league. So, you know, my best wishes to him and to everybody who, uh, you know, was connected with, with the St. Helens Club. And uh, it was great to see him. He's a great, absolutely great guy. And, uh, you know, as I say, it was a privilege for me to be there. I was so delighted to be invited by by Eamon and, and his fellow directors. And, um, it, you know, it was, it was a great night. Mm. Certainly. It'd be fascinating to sort of um, have a documentary sort of filmed on a player who's, you know, recently retired and just watching them go through that process of um, season endings, or not season ending, but, you know, uh, post-season surgeries and things like that to get their body right. Um, it's probably things we don't see as fans of the game. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think James Roby, uh, you know, is an iconic 
player. I mean, he's played 551 games for St. Helens, which is more than anybody else. He overtook the great Cal Coslett earlier this year. Um, and I think, you know, he, he ought to be... Some, somebody ought to do something on him because, uh, he, I mean, the, the, the only problem is that he probably wouldn't want it himself. He's, a, he's, he's not the sort of guy who pushes himself, um, you know, in, in, in that sense, in the in the media sense. But um, he's such a, 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 you know, an iconic player that he's got such... I mean, somebody like James has an awful lot to teach the rest of us, in my view, about what it means to be a great sportsman, what it means to be a great team man, and what it means to be a leader. Um, there's so much that he could teach, you know, up-and-coming players, but not just up-and-coming rugby players, but up-and-coming young people of any description, really. And um, I think it's, a, you know, I, I would like to see somebody um, r really create a, you know, some some sort of documentary about his career and his life and so on. Mm. Um, and he's he's got a great family as well. You know, he, his his wife Natasha was was there, and his son and so on. And um, they're, they're you know they're just an exemplary family, really. No, absolutely. I'm sure he'll continue to be a, a fantastic asset for the club and community going I'm sure forward. He will, that's yeah. for sure. So, yeah. Um, now. Moving on, we did have news this morning, what's well, being reported that uh, next year's Magic Weekend is going to be held on August the 17th and 18th, and it's going to be moved to Ellen Road uh, next year, Martin. What's your reaction to um, this reported news? Well, if it's true, and we assume, it, we assume that it is, A, it's going to be held on my wedding anniversary date, which is uh, uh, just a... a, a an oddity, a coincidence. It's not 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 been put there for that reason, but it's just a, just an observation. Secondly, my jaw dropped at the thought of it being held at Elland Road because that's a ground that I really don't like. Yeah. I think it's um, it's it's an antiquated football stadium in my view. Um, the seats are incredibly tight and small, and you know, uncomfortable. Um, the Elland Road ground is situated too far away from the centre of Leeds to for fans to be able to enjoy the same experience that they do in Newcastle, for example. Um, I mean, for, for me, Newcastle has always been the natural home of the uh, Magic Weekend, and if you take it away from Newcastle... I know a few years ago we had the, new, the Magic Weekend at Liverpool, at Anfield, Liverpool FC's ground, and it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same as being at Newcastle, so... In my view, if if we're moving it to Ellen Road, it's the first step to abolishing it. I'm yeah, afraid. Yeah. I I think it's a bad move, and um, you know I, I I would love again as always with these things. When I'm critical of something, it doesn't mean I don't hope it's a success. I hope it. You know I would love to see Ellen Road packed with fans for the both days of the Magic Weekend, but but for me it's a it's a step backwards from Newcastle. Mm. Oh, interesting. Uh, we'll move on, though. Uh, the Lee Leopards have their man. Uh, Matt Moylan has signed on a two-year deal from the Cronulla Sharks. What was your reaction to this? Well, news? I've always really enjoyed watching Matt Moylan. I think mm. he's uh, a very creative player. Um, I think, you know, he's, he's lost his place at Cronulla this year because they've got... They're fairly well stacked in the halfback positions, and um, Craig, Craig Fitz, Fitzgibbon, you know, went with an alternative to Matt. I think halfway through the year, and Matt obviously probably saw the signals and decided that he was on the way out. And uh, I assume that Derek Beaumont and Adrian Lamb. I mean, I'm, I'm told that Adrian Lamb went over there, you know, to have a, a face to face meeting with um, Matt Moylan to talk about his ambition for for, for the Le Lee Leopards. And sold the idea to Matt. So, mm. you know, Matt Moylan and Lachlan Lamb as a halfback combination, I think, looks pretty exciting. Mm. I've got to say, and you know, and, and not just not just is Matt Moylan a very good player, but he's also a very good, very articulate young guy. Um, I mean, he's in his early thirties now. Of course, he's been playing quite a while, but he's he's an articulate guy, good looking young bloke who I think will you know be be a good guy to have on the books at mm. Lee, you know, for helping to um, market the club as well as play for it. No, oh, absolutely. And, you know, for someone like Moylan who started his career at fullback and then eventually transitioned into the halves, you, you sort of saw around uh, midway through his career 
there was a few adjustment years there where he was kind of plagued with injury, but it took him a while to sort of find his feet in the halves. Um, but now, I think it might have been in Craig Fitzgibbon's first year at the club, there was talk of um, him uh, getting rid of Moylan, but he chose to stick with him and, and Nico in the halves, and um, Moylan had one of his best uh, seasons in the halves. And unfortunately, last year when they did uh, have a bit of a downturn, he was the man who got axed and never really found yeah. his way back into the no, squad. No, no, so that's right. I think he's got plenty of years of football left in him. And um, Well, they've signed a two-year deal, haven't they? So, mm. you know, he's certainly got two years mm. at, at the very least. So, no, I think he's, you know, I think he's a good signing. And, and Lee, it's an interesting sign, isn't it, for Lee? They're, they're not resting on their laurels. They're, mm. they're continuing to sign good players consolidating their position in in Super League obviously they're looking for a a grade A um, license in you know in, in the in, in accordance with these IMG um, grading system so it you know it's all all hands to the deck for Lee as far as I can see no, and good for Derek Beaumont you know he's as I say he's, he's determined to keep improving the club and and it's it's great to see mm. and we had a little discussion before um, I said that if you had to pick between Matt Moylan and Anthony Milford, who was the other player being touted, if you're going strictly on form over the past two years, Matt Moylan is the better signing. So Yeah, Anthony Milford is, is one of those guys who was a shining star when he first appeared on the scene, wasn't he? But mm. he didn't really fulfil that early promise. And, you know, that happens to some players, isn't it? They, they look great when they're younger, but they don't kick on in quite the way that you might hope. And there are various reasons for that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes injuries play a part and so on. But, um, but I think Mark Moylan is a more um, reliable signing, perhaps, we'll say, than, than, than Anthony would be. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt that Anthony Milford would give some moments of great excitement. Mm-hmm. But might also give some moments of sort of you know heart attack heart attack moments as well so you know i think they've got the right man there no absolutely and i think uh, they've also re-signed uh, rob mulhern going forward mm. i think as well another great retention for the club absolutely yes yeah, yes he's... well rob mulhern had a great season didn't he mm. and uh, he's had a, a funny career rob mulhern he's moved around a hell of a lot and um you know, I, I'm not quite sure why that is. I mean, he was at Hull KR, then Warrington, now at Lee. But he certainly seems to have found his, you know, spiritual home at Lee and uh, had a great year and obviously played for England in the Test Series against Tonga. Mm, and that's it. And sometimes it can just be finding that right coach and right system to really play your best football. And obviously he's found that at Lee, which Absolutely, is great yeah. stuff for them. Um, in other signing news, Mikey Lewis has extended with Hull KR on a five-year deal, which will see him through till the end of 2028. Um, a huge signing for, for Hull KR going forward. Huge, and um, it's it's great to see them, you know, doing that because he obviously has shone this year and um, played in the first two tests for England against Tonga and uh, was unlucky not to play in the third test or, you know, with George Williams coming back into the side as captain at standoff. But, uh, and it's not just that... Um, Mikey Lewis has signed a, a new long-term contract at Hull KR. He's actually been long-listed for the, this year's International Golden Boot, which is a great achievement uh, as, as well. Mm, yeah, absolutely right. In uh, recognition of his performances in those first two tests. Yeah, I'm just looking at the other English players nominated. We also had Harry Smith, uh, John Bateman and Matty Ashton uh, in the men's. And for the women's, um, we had Amy... Is it Hardcastle? Amy Hardcastle, Hardcastle? yes. And uh, Georgia Roach? Yes, Georgia Roach, who plays for Newcastle Knights now in the NRLW. Mm, So, you know, that's quite a good representation for both English sides, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd be very surprised if an English player won either Golden Boot, to be perfectly honest, when it comes down to it. But um, but there's quite a, 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 you know... significant um, panel who will make the judgment with mm. former great players and so on. Uh, so we'll we'll see what happens. But um, certainly being listed um, like this raises the profile of a player. Uh, I think Harry Smith um, in particular, I, thought, I think Harry Smith had a great series for uh, England and I'd be very surprised if there weren't, I think I've said before on this podcast, 
if there weren't um, Australian clubs looking at him as a potential halfback, um, as as time goes on, he's still a very young guy as well. So time is on his side. And then, of course, there's John Bateman, who's who's a remarkable player. I think w- w- one of those players who he's probably probably the best offloader in world rugby league i think mm. uh, that's arguable of course you, you you know you can't you can't say, can't say that for certain but i think his his ability to get the ball out of a tackle is is what marks him out he's such a strong player mm. his his strength belies his appearance actually he's much stronger than he looks as though he would be but yeah. as we've said before but you know great uh, i thought he had a great series too and matty ashton you know um Again, scored two tries in the second test, didn't he? And um, and and settled into his wing position really well in the absence of Dom Young. So mm. um, you know, g- good look, good look to those two. Amy Hardcastle um, has been a, a stalwart of England Women's Rugby League now for several years, and and she always plays well when whenever she dons that international jersey. And Georgia Roach, well, she's had a great year, hasn't she, with with Newcastle Knights and coming back to England to um, um, play a role in England's victory. So, uh, victory over Wales. So, you know, great, great to see those players uh, all being listed. Um, um, they, they, they face some pretty formidable competition, though, for... Um, you know, if they're going to win the actual award, and I'd be very surprised if they, if they did do. Um, I think this year it will go to a key to Kiwis at least in the in the men's uh, in the men's game. They've got uh, Charles Nickel Clockstad, Jerome Hughes, James Fisher Harris, Joey Tapino, and Ronaldo Mulitalo all listed. Mm. Well, given that they inflicted Australia's heaviest ever defeat 30 nil mm. this year I think um, I put my money on one of those five Kiwis getting the nod in the end mm. no absolutely and it'll be interesting because uh, Fisher Harris had such a great series he had a great season and you imagine if a front row forward uh, prop forward wins the oh, goal it'd boot. be amazing wouldn't it uh, yeah but I think he'd be thoroughly deserved if he did yeah no absolutely right so yeah do we know when the um, dates for that announcement will be I'm not sure no I don't know what the, I don't know what the date is uh, supposed to be actually mm. no but I, I would imagine it wouldn't be too long away no no we'll keep our eyes peeled and um, yes. certainly update all our listeners when that uh, winner is announced but um, we also had some news over the last week or so that the London Broncos have made the decision to um, pull the funding for their academy side they're choosing to invest in other areas well they've cited the fact that academies are not included in the um, grading system that uh, IMG have um, put forward and Bradford Bulls have done the same thing mm-hmm. Um which just sort of emphasises the point that it's ridiculous that um, the production of academy players isn't included in mm. the in, in in the grading system, um, and it, it's it's frustrating because L- London Broncos have have brought some really excellent players through their system um, over the years. Mike McMeekin, who, who of course played for England, is is one example. Lou McCarthy, Scarsbrook, who's just retired at St Helens, is another obvious one, and and. Um, and it's a great shame, in my view, that they've um, had to do, felt that they've had to do this. But uh, we'll see how that works out, and see whether they can keep producing players despite not having their own academy academy team. Mm. Yeah, you'd hope that they were still out and about looking for juniors and, and inviting oh, yes, juniors you so. to uh, you know training clinics and that sort of thing. But you would hope so. Yeah, but the, like you said, where's the incentive if uh, then it's not being taken into consideration? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm. You know the. the uh, I, I hate to say it, but I, I'm beginning to wonder whether this whole business about grading and IMG has been a terrible mistake that the game has made. But, you know, we'll see. Mm. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, the RFL has issued a number of fines to, um, we'll say, club stakeholders, because I know there's been a few um, coaches and owners fined uh, surrounding comments they've made um, sort of scrutinising the league and officiating throughout the season. I think I know Derek Beaumont um, mm. received a £2,000 fine for some of the comments he made following a match. Um, what, what do you make of this news, Martin? And Does it always happen at the end of the year? Do they wait till the end of the season no, to hand they out don't the fines? Normally, no, they normally find them much earlier. Um, but uh, I don't know, you know, I, 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 I've, I've got mixed feelings about this because I, 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 I believe that, you know, 
club officials ought to be able to speak out to speak their minds really mm. and Derek Beaumont um, his, his comments we've sort of reproduced them that he made to um, his hospitality guests after that Levy Wigan game it was the last match of the regular season and Lee had a a try in my view outrageously disallowed I think it was the wrong decision mm -hmm. I think a lot of people felt it was the wrong decision and that it was a very tight game and that might have settled the result of the game and um, if Lee had won that game instead of Wigan then they would have been fourth Wigan would have not won the league leader shield they would have been third um, Catalans would have won it St Helens would have been second and Wigan would have um, had to play in the first week of the playoffs so it had a it had a massive effect um, that 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 decision and 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 Derek who's a pretty emotional guy um, let's face it he, he you know he wears his heart on his sleeve um, couldn't resist making a comment about it and you could see in the TV coverage of that particular game how shocked he was and all the Lee people were were shocked when that try was disallowed supposedly for obstruction but you know if if <laughs> it just wasn't in my view mm. but anyway um, and Oliver Gildart also uh, was fined uh, for comments he made on social media follow following that game. Then there were some other um, club officials that were fined for similar sorts of situations. Um, so you know, but you've got to you've got to allow people sometimes the latitude to be able to make comments. And you know, I, it, it, it's. I think sometimes it's taking a sledgehammer to crack a walnut, but that's just my view. You know, I'm mm. I'm a great believer in free speech, and some people don't believe in in free speech the same way that I do. So, you know, it's um, the RFL obviously wants to protect its own image, but um, and I'm sure that what it, you know the fine is um, two thousand pounds with a thousand pounds suspended. I think for Derek. Yeah. I have a funny feeling that he can afford that uh, that amount, mm. um, but I'm sure he won't be happy having to pay it. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely right. And yeah. uh, I'm sure with the amount of uh, controversial decisions we've had this year that that list could have been a lot longer. Um, had oh, gosh, yes. A lot yes. more officials or, yeah. or coaches open their I mouths. mean, I've got, some, <laughs> I, I've got great sympathy with referees yeah. um, because I think referees you know, have the hardest job in the game. And I don't like to see them criticised, particularly by people who use bad language to, to, to criticise them. I think that's shocking. But in, in the league case, it was a video referee who, in my view, just got it wrong. Mm. And all, some, sometimes, you know, if you do get something wrong, you know, if we get something wrong in League Express, then I'm quite prepared to take the criticism for getting it wrong. I think that's only that's only right. So, mm -hmm. you know, and occasionally we do. So that's just life, isn't it? You you make a mistake and you get criticised for it and you hopefully don't make the same mistake again. No, absolutely right. No one's immune to criticism, unfortunately. No. Um, now, we've also had, uh, I think you mentioned it in your column this week, the RFL has a £450,000 uh, bill uh, to IMG. Is that the reported figure, or I well, know you tried to get figure. the reported figure? I've I've actually asked for for it to be confirmed by by the Rugby Football League. I, I, I emailed the um, chief executive Tony Sutton to ask for confirmation. He refused to confirm it, but didn't deny it. Mm -hmm. And there's always that thing, isn't there? If if somebody doesn't deny something, then it probably it's probably correct. Where they smoke this fire? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> In some and cases, and you know that that's a bit of a shock because. I think we were all told that um, IMG's return from its investment in Rugby League was, was going to come in the form of a percentage of any increase in broadcasting fees and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, the first broadcast deal since they were appointed actually saw a reduction in um, broadcast income. and um, But now it seems that um, the the deal with IMG, the contract is more complicated than that and that they are entitled to impose a, you know, a, a, a levy for work they've done on um, some of the digital um, advice that they've given to, to clubs. And without seeing the contract, you can't, you know, I mean, obviously, one assumes that the contract 
allows them to do that to to to, to do that obviously that's that they wouldn't be doing it if it didn't but it just sort of shows that um you know we weren't actually given the full information and and i'd still like to see i'd, I'd, I'd love to know who has actually seen the contract between the Ruby Football League and RL Commercial and IMG, because are there, are there some other shocks in it? We've all been very surprised that IMG have done nothing to try to promote the game since they became the RFL's partner some, about 18 months ago. They've done absolutely nothing. So it, it now looks as though the contract probably doesn't require them to do anything. So they mm. aren't doing. And that's just, it looks to me like a one-sided contract, to mm. be perfectly honest. Yeah, okay. And um, so a lot of that, uh, the bill is for pretty much, I guess, laying out the blueprint for the club's social media strategies. And well, I assume so. I assume so, but we can't be sure because yeah. because the RFL won't confirm it, mm. you know. And and it's it's about time they did. You know, let's be, you know, Tony Sutton, who I, I like as a guy, he's a, he's a very pleasant guy, but he keeps saying he wants to be transparent, but he isn't being. Mm. You know, you can't say you want to be transparent and then keep all these details secret. Mm. It's just, it, it's a contradiction i'm afraid mm. so for goodness sake let's be more transparent yeah absolutely yeah now um we've got a bit of a uh debacle happening at salford at the moment with their stadium uh and council i think the mayor is sort of urging his council counterparts to sort of um take C- over council members and, yes. yeah to um you know invest and take over ownership of the stadium it seems like we're in a bit of a standoff at the moment Yes, and it's very unfortunate because Salford have carried the name. Salford Red Devils have carried the name of their city ever since their creation back in the 19th century. Um, you know, they've been a, a, a great club in many ways over that period. But they moved into the um, Salford, the new stadium at Salford, some years ago, and I think they got a very bad deal. It was a, it was a stadium at the time that was fully owned by Peel Holdings, the property company, and I think quite frankly, Salford signed themselves into a really punishing uh, deal. They sold their old stadium at the Willows, and they've never really been able to recover from signing a, a you know, a, a, a deal that places a lot of stress on the club, really, financial stress. Um, they need the local authority to buy that stadium and then to reorganize, well, then to give them a new lease on, on, on more reasonable terms. And, they, you know, the local authority, if they... These councillors in, 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 in the Salford local authority, they don't seem to realise that they could lose their club altogether. And mm. um, if they do, that would be a tragedy that can't be, can't be rescued, really. Uh, Salford could either move out of the, the stadium, move to another part of Greater Manchester or even close down. Mm. You know, we've seen rugby union clubs closing down over uh, the last year or two and, and Salford could could follow them if we uh, if, if, if they don't get a decent deal on this stadium. So for goodness sake, Salford councillors, get off your backsides and get this sorted out and get behind your mayor who um, wants to um, who, 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 who wants to get this deal finally uh, agreed, Paul Den at the Salford Mayor, who I think I think is a very good guy, um, and 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 let's then see the Salford Club continue. Well, let's see it flourish, build up its support as it deserves to. And you know, I I, I said that in, in in my column this week that having been to St Helens, I, I wish I, I wish some of these Salford councillors could have been at St Helens to see how important a club is in its community, um, you know, as we saw on Saturday night at Saints. So, you know, g- get off your backsides and stop moaning and start helping. Mm, absolutely, because I know, like, back home in Australia, rugby league fans, they only know about Salford because of the Red Devils. You yes, know, exactly. Apart from yes. the Red Devils, we wouldn't even know where Sol- that is Salford in Salford is a city that's famous throughout the world because, because of its rugby league club, in mm. my view. And it's just absolutely ridiculous for these people not to recognise that and not to take pride in their own 
in their own club, it, I, I just think it's appalling, to be mm. honest. And especially when, you know, Australians come over here and for holidays, um, whether it be during the Super League season, Manchester's often a place that they will go to and the closest club to Manchester of itself. Course, so yes. it's going to attract... Uh, international Absolutely, fans as well yes. so fingers crossed they can get that all sorted uh Let's in the hope. coming months uh so yeah and um now heading down under um siosua takeaho the canterbury bulldogs uh, new recruit has uh failed a medical which um has i think pretty much he's going to lose his contract because of it by the sounds i'm not quite sure if it's well, been i think he's still got a year yet. left in his contract at catalans hasn't he yeah uh, so. I, I think so it looks as though he's going to be staying with them, but it was a foot injury that, um, I mean, obviously we don't know the details, but presumably it's a foot injury that hasn't healed. Mm. And, um, the, you know, will he need another operation on it to try and, you know, get it back into shape? Who knows? Mm. But uh, that will be disappointing for him, though, because he did want to return. I think he had family reasons for wanting to return to Australia. Mm. And... Uh, uh, you know, it leaves him in a bit of a limbo position, doesn't it? But mm. um, presumably he could stay with the Catalans, but uh, but who knows? Yeah, that's right. And um, we also saw a similar situation with Kai Pierce paul It looks like he's going to miss uh, potentially the start of uh, next season with a, a toe injury, I believe. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's been playing through all season, which was, um, you know, it, by all reports, it sounded like the Knights weren't too impressed by it, but... Now, what are you meant to do? He sort of was able to play throughout the year with it and manage it and obviously won a grand final. So. Yes, it's funny, actually. Uh, when you say a toe injury, it sounds quite trivial, doesn't it, really? <laughs> but actually, a toe injury can be really painful. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, if, you've got a, if you've got a bad toe and a broken toe, whatever, it, it, it's quite... It's a big distraction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the pain is quite intense. And it's better to get it sorted than to allow it to to fester really mm, no there's no worse feeling than stubbing your, your pinky toe on something <laughs> no, as you're walking through no. your home <laughs> no it makes me cringe to think of it oh absolutely yeah um now so we've also had uh, a recent announcement that the sheffield eagles are looking to uh, build a new stadium uh, how yeah well it's great great i mean Sh sheffield it's really interesting it's a major it's a major English city. You probably, obviously, as an Aussie, you, you won't know Sheffield at, at all. But, but it's a major city that's always been a football city, really. Uh, the round ball game, it's got two major clubs, United and Wednesday. But the Eagles were established in 1984. Uh, they'll be celebrating 40 years next year. And, and they've never really had a proper ground of their own. But, but in this case, they've... I mean, they're playing at the, at the moment at the Olympic Legacy Park, which is not a bad little venue, but, but not, not big enough to allow them to graduate into Super League. And they've combined with Sheffield FC, which, is the, which claims to be the oldest football club in the world, um, uh, which, you know, may or may not be true. I'm sure it prob probably is true, actually. But, um, but, but Sheffield FC is a historic club, and both... They and Sheffield Eagles have combined together to produce this plan for a new stadium in, in the south of the city. And it will be a, a, a sort of initially at least a 5,000 capacity stadium that should suit both clubs. And it would be, it would be great to see the Eagles, you know, having a, a home of their own. And it looks to me um, as though this plan is going to probably get the thumbs up from the local authority planning people uh you never can never be sure mm. but uh, hopefully fingers crossed and it could could even be built by about you know in time for the 2026 season so mm. that would be marvelous for the for the eagles if that's the case and uh you know good luck to them i spent 20 years working in Sheffield actually as a university lecturer there and you know there was quite a bit obviously f most of the people there were football fans but there was quite a bit of residual interest in in, in rugby league and it, it would be great to see the Eagles building on that and, and generating more junior clubs in the city for, for more young kids to play the game. No, oh, Absolutely. And uh, anything that can attract uh, more fans to the games, like absolutely. a new stadium will certainly attract uh, fans to their matches. So Dead right. Yeah. Fingers crossed it all gets approved. Um, now, over the last week or so, we've had uh, the new NRL Vegas commercial uh, officially released, which will be um, going to air on the Fox, Fox network over in the US. Have you had a chance to watch the 30-second clip? I have, but the thing that... I mean, 30-second clips, is you, you've, it's difficult 
producing a 30 second clip because there's not you know you've not got much time to include everything you want to include mm. and they've got they've 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 gone on this slogan of the no pads. What is it? No, no helmets, no pads. I think. Or no, no, like no, no pads, no helmets, no fear. Or something. Yeah. I think the, the, the thing is, which you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I, whether that will appeal to an American audience, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But I always think that if you're going to promote your sport, the one thing that's lacking from that video, and they'll probably pr produce more videos over time to help promote the event. But the the one thing that's lacking from it is visions of the crowd enjoying the game what always turns me on about any big event is watching the crowd enjoying enjoying the event mm. and i'm saying that partly because i watched a bit of the cricket world cup final on sunday and yeah <laughs> absolutely brilliant brilliant win for australia <laughs> yeah but you know those people it was played in a massive stadium with a massive crowd the vast majority of them wearing the blue indian shirts mm. and certainly in the early part of the game to, to watch the crowd and the way they enjoyed the game they the way they enjoyed the indian um innings apart from when wickets fell of course mm. uh that's the thing that makes you think my god i wouldn't being i wouldn't mind being there that you know that's what makes it look good mm. um you know crowds really getting into a game it, it, it is is really what counts in my book so you know i hope the nrl if they produce more videos will give more you know give more idea of the color and vibrancy that's in a a rugby league crowd in in, in australia no, absolutely. Then venues like suncorp and so on and so forth mm, yeah because um i mean i'm sure they've got heaps of and heaps of vision of crowd reactions oh gosh uh, yes you certainly don't want to be showing an empty uh sydney stadium oh, in the commercial gosh, so, no no <laughs> um, i think Give it stone dead wouldn't it yeah suncorp's definitely the uh, vision you want to be pulling um but yes i was uh very excited as an australian to see the boys win uh, over the weekend and mm. tell you what I think that that stadium over there had a capacity of around one hundred and thirty thousand. I think biggest cricket stadium in the world, isn't it? Just bigger wild. than the MCG. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I think the, the the camera operators did their best to uh, find the, the very few Australians uh, yes. seated <laughs> yeah. around the stadium. So yeah, um, yeah it was an, an incredible final. And, I didn't uh, see the end of it, but it must have been a massive disappointment for the crowd. How did the crowd respond to the Australians winning? Uh, like there was a lot of cheering when uh, David Warner's wicket fell and um, Steve Smith, but Travis Head sort of went out there and steered uh, the boys to victory. Obviously, Marnus went in and, and complimented him nicely as well. So yeah. uh, you could hear the, the crowd went from loud to silent uh, very <laughs> yeah. quickly throughout the innings, which was uh, yeah. uh, great to watch. So, yeah, that's uh, that's it for cricket for a while, um, but we'll see what, what comes up next in their calendar. Yes. Um, the only the, the last bit of news I have written down here um, is Michael Jennings, who is coming off a, a doping ban um, has well, looks like he secured a train and trial deal with his former uh, club, the Sydney Roosters. At the, I think he's in his early to mid thirties. Um, some might say he's potentially past his prime, but it'll be interesting to see um, if he can crack that Roosters side this year. Well, Michael Jennings at his prime was a really great player, mm. you know, a really tremendous player. And it was a shame that he had that um, problem with, you know, illegal substances and so on. And, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see him come back and, and make an impact again. And I'll keep my fingers crossed for him because, you know, he's always been one of my favourite Aussie players. And uh, I hope he does make it. And, I mean, it's a hard nut to crack getting into the Roosters' side, isn't it? Mm. But, um, you know, who knows? And, and just on the Roosters, by the way, while we're, while we're on them, um, it might be – it's probably worth just mentioning Joseph Suali'i because um, we all know that he's got next season with the Roosters before then moving to – uh, rugby union with a, a deal with the um, Australian Rugby Union to to play their game, but there's been a bit of speculation in Australia that uh, he might pull out of that deal now because, of course, when he was you know given that deal, um, since then the chairman of the Australian Rugby Union has resigned, and Eddie Jones, the coach who led them to a disastrous World Cup, has also departed and. Um, you know, Joseph might be feeling, you know, might be wondering what, what the future holds mm. for uh, Rugby Union there. So uh, at, at the moment, the, the, the Australian Rugby Union has a new chairman, uh, an, an ex-player, who has said, you know, uh, we're, we're not going to review that Joseph Suwali contract 
but he did add the words at the moment, mm. which sort of suggests that they might review it at some time in the future. Mm. So, you know, I, who, who knows? But um, I would obviously quite like to see Joseph staying in rugby league because he's a good, mm. m- tremendous talent, and uh, and I hope he does. And uh, if he does, you know, whether the, whether the Roosters could get him under their salary cap, um, in 2025 if he reversed his decision to go to Rugby Union who knows but mm. I think there'd be plenty of other clubs wanting to make a pitch for him if that weren't the case mm. they might not be able to offer him the same money but you, you have to think if they can give him a competitive offer he might stay for less you know? oh yes so, yeah you think so um, yeah we'll see what happens there um, but you've just opened up uh, this section of the League Express newspaper well, I, here I Martin wanted to, I wanted to say that we've got a a centre spread this week in League Express looking at all the new boys who are coming um, to the um, Super League this year from from the NRL and there are 17 of them so far uh, and we give a bit of a a, a, a lowdown on all of them some of them more famous than others of course mm. um, you know some somebody like um, Paul Momorowski's um, quite a well probably the best known guy I would mm. think Tarek Sims is also Tarek Sims he's yeah. also up there he's, well, he's yeah. also um, com- coming to the um, Catalan Dragons he, he's going to be quite a useful a useful guy um, mm. so you know no it's 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 really an interesting um, parade of, of players plus some players who are coming back to Super League after having been here before including mm. Matt Frawley coming to Leeds Cruz Leeming coming back to Wigan of course and Luke Thompson also mm. coming back to Wigan so we're going to have been busily re-signing English players who've been in the NRL with varying degrees of success. But mm. um, so it's going, to, it's going to be really interesting to see how all that works out, isn't it? Who are you out of this list? Is there any player that you're most excited to, to watch? I like Jaden Ockenbaugh, who's mm. coming to Hull FC. He's a real big, strong back rower or winger, and mm. um, you know I watched him. He got into a bit of trouble, didn't he, in Queensland? With he was with the Bulldogs and got into a bit of a trouble with um you know going off with a a, a young female supporter and and being a bit foolish there but um let me just let me just stop that yes that's 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 okay um but i think i think he's going to be a a fan's favorite at at hull and i think they've also signed a pretty good player in herman sesi i think Mm. i think he could do a good job for them as well so you Absolutely. know and and franklin pelly as well the prop from the um, bulldogs a very young player um but a, again a kid with a lot of promise and i'm, I'm surprised that they've let him go mm, so he runs like a wrecking ball yeah he's uh, absolutely yeah off, off the back fence um is the, the common term and he's the yeah. player that comes to mind yeah someone that absolutely. just sprints the ball back off the kickoff and lucky miller coming to leeds at full back he's um come out of rugby union sevens didn't he mm-hmm. the newcastle knights signed him well in fact cronulla signed him originally mm-hmm. he went to the knights but then i thought played very well at fullback but then lost his place at fullback to the great kaelin ponga mm-hmm. so you know i think any fullback would lose a place to kaelin ponga wouldn't they <laughs> so i think he could be I, I think it could be a real good signing for leeds no absolutely i'm uh i'm Really looking forward to watching how Jaden Nikarima goes uh, at Catalans. Obviously, mm. um, he's sort of been... He was always sort of in the shadow of Cody uh, Nikarima coming through the system. I remember when they both played in the under-20s uh, for the Brisbane Broncos. I think they went to a under-20s grand final and unfortunately came up short. And He was sort of in the Broncos system before the Roosters poached him. Uh, he didn't get a chance to debut for the Broncos. Um, but yeah, the Roosters poached him and then he got into a little bit of off-field trouble with the Roosters and eventually the Storm picked him up but he's always been a player that had tremendous potential but never quite got the shot I felt so um, I think he'll be a bit of a smoky uh, for the Catlins Dragons keep an mm. eye on him I think he could have a, a great impact if he can play to his potential. He could do. I mean he only played a couple of games as, you know for the Storm but you know that's not necessarily a massive criticism when you think that he was up against Cameron Munster and mm. um, Jerome, Hughes, yeah. Jerome Hughes you know th- those are people if if those two guys don't get injured mm. it's difficult to force your way in ahead of them isn't it so absolutely yeah it's going to be fascinating to see how that works out mm, absolutely
absolutely. Um, well, that's all I've got uh, for today, Martin. Anything else from you that you want to touch no, on? No, I think mate? we're all absolutely fine. Um, we've talked about quite a bit and managed to keep going despite the fact that we're in the off season. So that's yeah. that's great, Jake, and thanks for that. Yeah, no worries. And uh, I hope. Um, we get plenty of people who enjoy watching us. No, absolutely. And uh, don't forget, if you do want to uh, secure your subscription to the uh, League Express weekly newspaper, you can head along to www.totalrl.com forward slash shop. And uh, the uh, Rugby League World magazine will be released this Friday, Out on I believe. Friday, yes. Go, yeah. to, go to our website, again, to totalrl.com forward slash shop to subscribe to Rugby League World. I think you'll really enjoy it. Mm. It's a great issue coming out. Absolutely. All right, Martin. Well, um, thanks again, mate. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll be back, fingers crossed, next week with plenty of news to discuss. Okay, that's great. Thank you, absolutely. Jake. No See you all next week.